המלאכים בעולם מחכים לי בדרך. לא צריך למהר, הכל יסתדר, זה יבוא עם הזמן. יש דברים חשובים באמת, זה בסוף בפרטים הקטנים. לפעמים לא צריך לדבר, גם בשקט מצאנו מילים. שרק תחייך כל החיים, זה כל מה שאני מבקשת. בית קטן, גינה לילדים, תאמין, אני מאושרת, תדע שאני... התחברו עם הדרך. הפחדים יפחדו, שלא תיפתחו, זה יבוא עם הזמן. יש דברים חשובים באמת, זה בסוף בפרטים הקטנים. לפעמים לא צריך לדבר, גם בשקט מצאנו מילים. שרק תחייך זה כל מה שאני מבקשת בית קטן, קינה לילדים תאמין, אני מאושרת תדע שאני Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Wow. It's people. Um, my name is Karen Levin. I am the executive director of the Baltimore Zionist. I'm really excited to have you here today for our second part of the Silk Road. The first part is on um, YouTube. If you missed that, all you have to do is go to YouTube and put in Baltimore Zionist District and you can watch that. Also, if you go to YouTube, uh, someone said someone that something is covering my mic. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, Adi, okay, um, awesome. So if you go to YouTube this past Sunday, we had our Israel Symposium, which was actually live here in Baltimore in person, which was a great event, but we were also able to stream that to YouTube. I highly, highly, highly suggest that you go and watch that. We had four incredible speakers. I know that some of you were, were on, were here in person, which was great. It was, it was so great to see some of you, even though our faces were covered, um, but it was really wonderful to see you um, and, to, and to hear you. It's muffled. Um, it's okay. <clears throat> Maybe it's my voice. It was really great to see you. Um, and some of you saw the call on, on the streaming on YouTube. If you didn't see it, please go on YouTube and watch it. It was an incredible program with amazing feedback. Um, and the mic is cutting out. 
Adi, can you talk and see if your mic is better? And if it is, I'll come to your office. Sure. Um, so as Karen mentioned, we did have our IVA symposium in person held in here in Baltimore, which was great. And you can go to our YouTube um, channel at all times. Just go to YouTube, search Baltimore Zionist District, and um, you can see it. It's probably the last thing over there. You also have the first part of the Silk Road if you missed it. And the second part, which we'll have today, will be on there as well. So for all of you, we'll ask during the call. Yes, this um, call is recorded and it's gonna be on our YouTube channel to watch again or if you need to go um, in the middle. So I'll just give um, my seat for Karen to tell you about something amazing that we're doing with Jacob. Okay, fast switch of the computers. I'm glad we're back at work. So hopefully this is better. Um, so yes, go watch that show. Uh, go watch the program on Israel. It was incredible. So Jacob will be here momentarily and we are still admitting people. But for those of you who are joining us for the first, first time, which I don't know how many of you you are, you're in for a treat. Jacob um, Choshan is an incredible guide. He has led us through many tours and we absolutely adore and love him. We are going to be going to Israel with Jacob live and in person um, in March, hopefully, fingers crossed. The dates for that are going to be March 22nd um, through April 17th. It's going to be a 17-day tour in Israel, and Jacob has planned an incredible tour that we have been working on um, fearlessly for the past two months, Adi and Jacob and um, a few other people from our board here, um, not just for Baltimore people, anybody can come from any state that you are in, any country that you are in and meet us in Israel from wherever you're from. We are going to be hosting three um, virtual informational sessions in November. Those dates are going to be out um, in the next couple of weeks. If you would like to be um, on that list of people that want to join our informational session, please send me uh, an email so that I can get you on that list for informational sessions. Um, uh, Rachel will, Rachel RD will drop my email in the, um, in the chat so that I can get you on that list. Of course, the tour to Israel is will not be able to host all 426 of you. It's going to be limited to a number of people. Um, my email is going to be in the chat. Please email me. I see that your people are email people are putting their names in the chat. I won't be able to gather everyone's email um, from the chat. It's just going to be too many people. But please email me separately after the call. I will add you to the list, and we will send you a personal email. Um, Adi, do we see Jacob? I know that he was um, stuck in a little bit of traffic, so he should be here um, momentarily. But in the meantime, um, he should be here in about two minutes. But in the meantime, I would really love to hear from anybody who's been on the calls with us or anybody that has any questions for myself, for Adi about anything that you would like to see from the BZD or any questions that you've had about any of our tours, any of our events, any comments that you'd like to make. Um, you can raise your hand virtually or unmute your mic. We'd really love to hear just anything that you, you want to say. We'd really love to hear from you. There's a virtual option to um, raise your hand that maybe for five minutes just to have a little chat. There's a reaction uh, button at the bottom of your um, computer. Um, so just while we wait for Jacob, he's stuck in Israel traffic. So it could be two minutes before we actually start uh, the Zoom. So sorry about that. But anybody want to say anything? Or okay, Ken Birnbaum, amazing. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Ken, is the, unmute. When is the trip to Israel? Doesn't it end on Pesach? It ends right before, actually. I see it's like a week before. It said you said the 17th. No, the seventh. The seventh. So it's oh, March twenty second to April seventh. It's a seventeen day trip. Okay. So it will be right before, 
And um, so that will bring everybody back right before Passover. And some people may want to stay and hang out for Passover if you have family there. That's why we did it that way. Um, Zina, I'm going to, Ken, I'm going to mute you again. Oh, I'm sorry, you muted yourself. Zina, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Uh, your trip, I just got on, so I'm sorry I didn't hear the no, announcement. No, that's okay. And for people who are just getting on just really quickly, um, uh, Jacob is running two minutes late in traffic. We'll start as soon as he gets here. I'm Go interested ahead, in, yeah, I'm interested possibly in traveling uh, with your group. And you know, I'm from California. Yes. Um, well, most of the people are going to be from Baltimore, but are they members or is it open? No. To so I don't know if most of the people are going to be from Baltimore. I think most of the people are just going to be from everywhere and anywhere from what we know of. And you don't have to be a member. We're really, people are going to be from everywhere and anywhere. And we're really excited to meet everyone who's been joining our trips. Uh, everyone who's been joining our virtual trip for the past uh, 18 months. So absolutely everyone is, we're not closing it for Baltimore uh, community and we're really opening it for really anyone who has been joining our events for over the past 18 months. We're really excited to meet um, everybody who's, who's joined us. And can I assume that you're going to be sending information out because I obviously Absolutely. Absolutely. So the virtual Are they by um, mail or email, the, it's the trip, it's going to be by email just because we can reach so many more people faster. And that's why we'll have the info sessions as well. So we can get as much information as possible. Is there a like early sign up special? And I don't need the details so much as that. And the and is there a limit on how many people are you if you fill a bus? Are you going to fill another bus? We're probably on just going to do one bus, right, Adi? Yeah, we're just going to do one bus this time. Okay, so first yeah. come. Okay. Yeah. First come Thank you, you ladies. <laughs> You're Good, welcome. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to this information. And uh, do we all have to be online with you to come? So if I brought my husband who never really sits with me these mornings? No, he can come too. <laughs> Unless I don't Bosses want are welcome. Okay, <laughs> great, um, thanks. Adi, do we have a time for Jacob, do you know? Oh, you're muted. Wait, okay, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. <laughs> uh, yes, unfortunately, Jacob is still in traffic. We need another um, minute or two, but we do have another person here. Gloria, I see, has uh, her hand. Oh, so I'm, I'm sorry. Gonna... Okay, Gloria, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. I am, thank you so much. This is a wonderful opportunity. I live in California and I take uh, classes for older adults at a community college and we're studying um, the Silk Road. And so um, uh, will this recording be available for me to give to the professor and how do I do that? Yes. So the recording for this and the first one, actually it's streaming live right now on YouTube. So as soon as this is over, you can go to our YouTube page and view this recording and just grab the link and send it to your professor. Anybody on here can do that. Um, I actually do want to make a note while everybody's on here. Next week's yep. recording, write a D, which is the, um, the next week's recording, will not be, re next week's event will not be recorded. So if you're signed up for next week's event and you don't show up, unlike many of our other events, it will not be recorded, so you will not have the opportunity to rewatch it. So I okay. do that. What is that your will... link? I'm sorry if I interrupted you. What is your link? It's you just go to YouTube and put, put in Baltimore Zionist District. Thank you so and much. All, anything that we have recorded will be will be available. Okay, so he can get I can get it for the for the previous week as well. Yes. He's gonna love it. He teaches Jewish art, even though he happens not to be Jewish, but thank you. Okay, I'm going to be quiet. Yes, of course. Um, Doris, I'm going to just mute you, Gloria, and I'm going to ask you, Doris, to unmute. And yep, there you go. Um, I just want to know, next week's program is the Lost Tribes, correct? Yes. Um, where can I, I thought I'd registered, but pro okay, can you tell me how to register again? Yes, we're going to put a link in the chat right now, and okay. that way you can just click on it and register. And just again, a reminder for the Lost Tribe, um, it won't be recorded. So um, please join us on, on that day because we will not be able to record it. 
Um, and your programs are fabulous. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And um, Zena, you can see that actually, quick note that we have our biggest uh, majority of people actually are Baltimore, New York, California, Canada. <laughs> um, so we do have, where? Lost it. What did you say? I can't read lips. <laughs> Adi saying something. <laughs> I'm the worst lip reader. Florida. Oh, Florida. Yes, Florida. <laughs> yes, we have a, lots of people from Florida. I, a lot, big props to the California people because they get up very early. For the people that are just coming in now, um, we're waiting for Jacob. He's stuck in Israel traffic. So sorry. Um, but, you know, happens. So, but um, feel so free to raise your hands and if you want to chat with us or just say hi um, or and ask myself or Azia a question, uh, we're happy to answer them. This is an opportunity because we never open our chat because we have so many participants. So, okay, Elaine, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Can you, can you just um, re, just, uh, say the dates again? Yes. So the Israel trip is planned for March 22nd through April 7th. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And, and when are we going to, and when are we going to know, um, do you have any idea of when the, the, um, the info date, the information sessions are going to be held? Evening, daytime. What yeah, so we're going to try to space them out in November. So it'll be three different days in November before Thanksgiving. Um, and they'll be both evening and days and different times. So we'll really try to make them convenient. I don't have the exact dates and times yet, though. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Do you look like you have something? I just saw Jacob wrote me that he will be oh. here in a minute. So sorry, Rachel. but we do have Shani Frank, so we can have her. Um, oh, okay. Ask her questions. I just and Rachel to also. At, next you know. week will not be recorded. What time will next week be? The same time as this? Same time, yeah. So all of BZD events are Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, 11 a.m. Eastern on Tuesdays. Thank you so much. Okay, oh, great. Oh, you're welcome. I'll write it down on my calendar. Thank you. Yes, every and that's Tuesday. Africa, next week, Jews of Africa? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and then the week after is um, Adi. What? Why do you keep muting? Stop muting. <laughs> it's uh, uh, the Jews of St. Petersburg, Russia. Oh, the Jews of St. Petersburg, which is also going to be a wonderful program. Is Jacob doing all of those two? Or are no, people? those are two different hosts. And then in November, we have something very special planned. Right, okay, so I'll tell you what it, I'll tell you what it is, just because you all have, everyone has been so patient. I'm, I'm just going to tell you what it is. It's going to be live tours of Israel all month in different places. I'm not going to tell you where because okay, that's Jacob just a again? lot of information. But we're going to be live. Yeah. And the Israel tours will be Jacob again, I assume. No, those are going to be, we're going to be partnering with Stand With Us and go, going live in Israel all month. Okay, all great. different places. It's on always, Tuesdays at 11. At 11. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Yes. Okay, so great. that's, but don't tell anybody. That's between me and the 451 of you. but it's, it's going to be very exciting. And one of them is going to be a Hanukkah special because Hanukkah apparently is very early this year. And somebody told me I should go buy my gifts early. Okay, oh. Zena, I'm going to unmute you. Are you okay. unmuted? Okay. Uh, two two, one question, one comment. Question was on that three part Sunday program that was held live. I think you said there was going to be some connection. I just obviously didn't get up early enough to be able to enjoy that one. That started earlier than 11. Yes, years. it did. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, do you have those programs recorded for me, uh, for us to access? The one that was just this Sunday? 
the Sunday, it was a three-parter or a two-parter with the comedians. Well, you are you talking uh, about a different, a different program called The New Jew that I'm yes. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. We unfortunately had to cancel because they couldn't uh, come to Baltimore. It's supposed to be right. um, in-person uh, meeting with the main actress and the, the creators of the TV show, but because they couldn't come, so we um, needed to cancel it. So we don't have recordings because it didn't happen at the end. Well, that's good. I didn't miss anything, but I'm sad you didn't have a chance to present it. My, my second point is a comment. I have to tell you, as a nonprofit, you guys rock. You mm -hmm. are Thank responsive you. to us. And when I ask questions or if I am curious about something, people get back to me. I very much appreciate your attention and the programs that you provide and what this organization stands for. And it was just a happy mistake that it came to my email one day. And I'm I'm a loyal fan. And hopefully Thank it's something. Thank you. Thank you. And we really, truly couldn't do it without um, everybody on this call and our many other calls, um, because truly, we, we really couldn't. We really um, have been able to have 70 plus programs with all the um, support and donations that we get that we've gotten over the two years. That's, I mean, truly, we really have through the, the support and the kindness of, of everybody on these calls is how and truly I can honestly um, say that. So thank, thank all of you. Um, and, and all the feedback that we've had from our surveys and what people want to see um, and what, what you guys want to see in the places that you guys want to go, the Jewish heritage, um, places in Israel. Um, that's, that's really, we've taken a lot, a, a D, Rachel and I really sit and take a lot from the surveys of what you all want to see and the places that you guys want to go and where you don't want to go and what, what you don't want to do. And we really take that into consideration um, when we put our, our, when we put this with this winter programming um, together over the summer, which uh, took a while, but we, we did it. So, um, yes, yeah. on that note, I will say also thank you for your patience today. Um, unfortunately, Jacob uh, was in traffic more than two yeah. hours um, in traffic and he was supposed to get home already a few minutes ago, but um, we're still waiting for him to log into his computer. So really thank you for your patience staying here with us. Uh, we know it's, um, um, it's not something that we can take for granted. So really thank you for that. And I really hope to have him on us uh, on the Zoom in like a minute or two. Um, and while we wait for him and Oh, I see we have another question. Which I'm is... going to say that this is worse than DC traffic. Okay, Gloria, I'm going to unmute you. Um, thank you again. Um, there's this wonderful professor. Um, <laughs> he teaches like a thousand older adults. And so you might get an onslaught of new people. And obviously, you, you know, we will, I will share that with them. But you know, I know that you can use donations. So mm -hmm. um, give me your, yeah. your full name again. And, and uh, you know, I'm glad he, I'm not glad he's stuck in traffic. Um, I will look at the email, but, uh, and, and so if I go to the, to the website, do I have to type in all of these little characters in order to actually the, locate um, I, these YouTube videos? We will, we will private message you my email and then I can send you all the information. For where, where you can Excellent. get, I'll private message you my email, and then I can send you all the information to access the recording. Okay, and I won't share that with him right now, but thank you. I oh, you're welcome. You. Um, okay, uh, Leah, and then um, Tamara. I'm not familiar with BZD. I've been do, watching some of your your programs, and I've thoroughly enjoyed them. But I'm curious. Um, do you guys have a perspective on the settlements in Israel? So, uh, so you're so you're not familiar. So we we definitely do, but we really try to stay. Uh, of course, we do as Adi as an Israeli who lives in Israel, and Adi is our shlicha. Um, I do as an Israeli American who was born in Israel. I was, came here at the age of ten, and I've lived here um, for thirty years. 
Um, and of course, I'm sure Rachel does. But as an organization, um, we really try to not do too much on politics, um, really. So um, it's and it's really such a big conversation to to discuss. And Jacob is here right at the right time. So I'm going to let Jacob take over. Um, but it's a great question, Leah, and something that we may um, have a symposium on next time. But I'm going to let Jacob take over since Jacob is, where is he? Okay, great. And we will definitely discuss that, Leah. Jacob, welcome. 456 people waited for you. You are muted. You are muted. Uh, Rachel, just ask him to unmute, please. Okay. My goodness, first I have to apologize from the bottom of my heart. This is the most embarrassing thing that ever happened. So it's sorry, okay, so, so sorry. So sorry. Okay, can you see the opening slide? Okay, thank you. So the last time we have crossed over from Central Asian countries we were in, um, Kyrgyzstan, we were in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and we crossed these mountains into China. This is very interesting, crossing this uh, barrier. We will uh, start at going to Irkeshtam uh, on the Chinese territory, but we are in a very unusual Chinese territory. Look at this area. It was influenced by a great civilization called Sogdiana from 2300 years ago that has uh, controlled the trade routes throughout this part of the world and has influenced with architecture, with cuisine, with fashion, with all kinds of industrial technology and trade. This is not only how commerce came, we must dedicate a minute and say that this is how religions entered. One of the most fascinating religions that prevailed in this area and made its way throughout this region, Zoroastrianism. This is a very fascinating monotheistic religion. We are not sure when did Zarathustra, Zoroaster, when did he live, whether it was 3,200 years ago, but certainly 2,600 years ago, they have already formed the religion, which is the most interesting religion. It has to do with worshiping fire, plays a very important role, which is why they have been persecuted by many other civilizations who consider them to be not only heretics, but pagans. By the way, they are still being persecuted today in Iran, where many of them are there because they think their religion is a pagan religion. One of the things that are most interesting about this religion, and we find their shrines and sanctuaries along the Silk Road, they don't bury their dead. They take the, the dead into what they call towers of silence, and they leave them there for the birds of prey to go through the remains of their people, which again, sounds very strange to many people, and that's why, again, they were being Control. Do you know a few people who belong to this religion? Freddie Mercury was a member of this group. They are not only a religious group, but an ethnic group called Parsi. So Freddie Mercury. And another gentleman you might uh, remember is Zubin Mehta, who until two years ago was the conductor and musical director of the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra. He also belongs, he was born in India to a Farsi family, and he was also a Zoroastrian. So another religion came in, and these were the Nestorians, the early form of Christianity, which is quite interesting because they were ostracized by other Christian groups. Actually, they were shunned by the different ecumenic conventions, but in many parts of Asia, they still prevail not given in into Greek Orthodox or Catholic or other denomination. So this is how China became Christian. And you find, other than the Jews in China, you find Christians in China. And it's, again, very ancient form of Christianity. We're talking second, third century Christianity. And uh, they still are very, very much present and very active in China. But the region we came into, is a Muslim region. The region we came into is the 
land of the Uyghurs. This is how we call this ethnic minority. Look at their facial features. So they look a little Chinese with a little Turkic kind of um, uh, bone structure and facial features. And they occupy a huge region, which is an autonomous region, which is called Xinjiang. I was in a hurry, I didn't get the pointer. Let me quickly get the pointer. So this is the area called Xinjiang. That's the only place, by the way, in China, for example, that are allowed to have their own time zone. The rest of China uses only one time zone, which means it can be four o'clock in the morning for us. I mean, the light is not out until eight, but that's already eight o'clock because that's how China decided. And Xinjiang area is something that is uh, typical of what they do with inundating the different regions with Chinese people. So look, this was a Muslim area. They are down now to 55% Muslims, like in Tibet. They have flooded with tens of millions of Chinese. So there is no way there's gonna be ever Tibet again. What is interesting about the Uyghurs, they are led in many ways by women, not only matriarchs and leaders in the society, but also they are imams. Never in any other Muslim society do they have women imams, which is like a spiritual religious leader. And this area is unbelievable in the sense that the ladies call the shots, they direct, they instruct, and so on, and so on, and so on. We'll uh, begin uh, the trip with one of the main gateways into the Uyghur area, which is a main station along the Silk Road, the town of Kashgar. We are on the, so we are on the edge. Did Sorry somebody say interrupt. something? Yeah. Uh, Jacob, uh, we just, we hear some noises from your end, if you can uh, just uh, talk a little bit louder. Okay, I'll try. I stopped Thank in you. the middle of the road and I went into a hotel lobby, lobby and I sit here. So there are other people here and I'm so sorry because I would have never made it home within the next hour or so. It was the craziest trip from Jerusalem ever. Nearly three hours of a trip from Jerusalem to, uh, and I mean, not in Tel Aviv yet, I'm in Ramat Gan. I stopped at the hotel lobby. I'll try to be louder without having everybody come and beat me up here in the lobby. So we're on the edge of the desert. And this uh, town is known to have always been a major, major stop along the Silk Road. Hence, traditionally, the festive and uh, uh, special clothes for special occasions were always made out of silk. That is something that typifies the people in this town. Their architecture is inspired by the Muslim architecture that came in from the West, from the Muslim countries. And it's quite interesting to take a walk through the very narrow, very interesting picturesque uh, lanes of the town. One of their major leaders was Abak Hoja and his tomb is a big sanctuary and a major pilgrimage site. Millions of uh, Chinese Muslims come from all over China to come and visit the tomb, which again is a very ornate, you can see with the beautiful ceramic tiles, with the beautiful decorations, as we have seen in other masterpieces of Muslim architecture, here we do it as well. I love the fact, the way they celebrate and I love the way they eat. They uh, have their meals and festivities sitting on the floor it's like a family style. Everybody reaches into the uh, main dishes and they grab them. And I love, look at this cute baby with the special clothes and especially the head cover. Again, here we find these fascinating marketplaces with their specially baked goods. Something you cannot stop. When you start with one of these baked stuff, they are so unbelievable. You cannot stop. And this is something that continues. You see, when we talked about the Silk Road, nobody carried a, a garment of silk or a roll of uh, fabric all the way from China to Europe. So they went for a few miles or a few dozens of miles or a hundred miles, and they met somebody who sold them something else. And that's how they traded. So the marketplaces offer goods that come both from East and West, and uh, uh, unbelievably, but it still continues. So now they use planes and trains and trucks in addition to the camels and horses, but this trade still goes 
through these uh, towns and especially, of course, the silks, the brocades, the tapita, the different fabrics and the different colors and designs. You walk in the marketplace and it's dazzling, really blinding you with the beautiful shining coming from the silk. Look at the spices and the herbs. This is so unusual because hardly anything grows here. We are in the desert, but they get their stuff both from East and West and they trade it with the locals and others. This is a modern marvel. Thank you, China, for creating this incredible highway connect uh, China to uh, Pakistan. So this is the Karakoram Highway. It's one of the most beautiful roads anywhere in the world. It's winding and twisting itself in the mountain. And when it comes to the valley, Look at the interchanges that they have built. This is modern technology if you've ever seen one, whereas the rest of the road goes through this very mild, very quiet countryside with the terraces where they grow the rice and fruits and vegetables along the rivers. And the rivers are mighty. They get all the snow that melts from, down from the Himalaya and from the Pamir Plateau to go down into the oceans. And uh, I must admit, this is one of the most picturesque, most exciting road trip you can take through the desert. Look at the zigzags to go over the mountain because they cross the mountains with this highway. I mean, who's ever seen a highway that goes this way? Uh, I mentioned the fact that one of the, uh, the circumstances or the conditions that enabled the Silk Road was the ability to get every now and then to some grassland, to some uh, steps or area where they can feed the animals. Otherwise, they would have to carry even more food for the animals when they have to go. Sometimes they go 100, 120 miles in the desert. So the road tries to navigate itself through this kind of uh, countryside so they can feed the animals. Urumuchi is the biggest town. This is really the capital of the uh, Kashgar or of the, sorry, of the Uyghur people. It's a very modern city, typical of what you see in China, but with the addition of the Muslim shrines and Muslim sanctuaries that we see here. They, uh, they specialize in something that was spread from here later on through China, because Chinese people don't have this shishlik and kebab. This is where it came from and inundated, and now you can find it everywhere in China. But it was always the Uyghurs who set shop selling their wares not only in their region, they move into Beijing and Shanghai and other parts of the country. I love the very colorful marketplace of Urumqi, Urumqi. That's the name of the capital. And look at the beautiful wares do they have. For example, a whole industry based on gourds. They use the pumpkins and the gourds and they make musical instruments and containers and light fixtures and uh, all kinds of containers. It's a huge specialty of this region. Not to mention, of course, the very beautiful uh, jewelry that they have. They love it to be very, very colorful. So again, the typical uh, site, here we have Muslim shrines with Chinese inscription. We leave the countryside and we leave the city and we go into the countryside. To go do that, we have to cross maybe the most cruel desert in the world. It's next to the Gobi Desert. They create together the largest uh, deserts and it is dry, it's hot, it's hostile. But this is the desert that the Silk Road had to take in order to get from one place to the other. And they still do, leading their camels. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the desert, we have another religion that came here. Buddhist religion. Again, these are the roads that Buddhism infiltrated down from India. We talked about the highway from neighboring Pakistan. Buddhism comes from India, infiltrated into China. And a thousand years ago, a big temple was built here in the desert by the monks who were seeking solace. They were seeking peace. They were seeking quiet. And it's a remarkable place to visit the shrine outside with the carved images and statues and inside the caves. There are many caves, not a thousand, but hundreds of caves with some of the most beautiful murals, some beautiful paintings and frescoes and stacos. 
telling amazing stories from not only the Buddhist book, but also from the local history of the rulers and the governors who adopted and embraced Buddhism centuries and almost almost 1800 years ago. That's what we estimate. That's when Buddhism really came into China. In uh, other locations of this complex, look at these hanging temples that lead you all the way up to some of the largest Buddha statues anywhere in Asia. And again, in a different section from a different period, this is only 600 years of age from local royalty who built these amazing uh, uh, statues and sculptures and look at the reclining Buddha with the images of the believers looking at the reclining Buddha and look at the decoration on the walls and on the ceiling, literally everywhere. You see, this should be in the best museums in the world. It will be a major attraction, but it was only discovered a little over a hundred years ago by the foreign and Western civilizations. And it's worthwhile making the pilgrimage to see the different nuts and the different guards. And to see Buddha, Buddhism has no God in their religion, but over the years they've added lots of deities and lots of quasi-deities elements to it, and they perfected their artwork to some unbelievable high records between the sculptures, between the wet paintings, and so on. So there are a few of these places. I only stopped at one because I hope that when you'll take the trip, and I hope you will, you must make the effort in the middle of the desert to pay a visit to this shrine. Not far from here, a few hundred miles from here, of course, in China, a few hundred miles is not far. We come to the Flaming Mountains. This is an unusual terrain where because of whatever has erupted here billions of years ago and eroded and pulverized, look at the beautiful colors created by the different minerals that make the place. Look at this picture, guys, this is not touched up. This is not Photoshop. This is what it looks in reality. So tell me if this is not the most amazing sight to see. Yes, you have to schlep into the desert. You have to take long distance into the desert. But I personally think it's worthwhile because look at the beauty of this region, the flaming mountains. We go to yet another a site of antiquity, Jiayuguan city, when we see the tombs from two dynasties. They are local dynasties. They didn't rule over most of China, but over a large region of China. We're going 800 years ago, the Wei and Jin tombs. And here is where we have hundreds and hundreds of tombs carved into the rock and sealed. They buried the people in the caves and in the holes and in cavities, which were hewn and chiseled out of the bedrock. But I am amazed and mesmerized by the artwork, by the paintings that you can see. And you can learn, for example, these are the musicians. So you can see the guy with the drum and the guy with the flute and the cymbals. And you learn so much. In another location, the Tong, again, talking about hanging temples, look how they hang and cling to the side of the rock. And that's where you again find some beautiful, beautiful artwork. We learn about their clothing. We learn about, they didn't have wardrobes, so that's how they would keep their clothes. You can learn so much from looking at the paintings and the murals. And then again, you go out and you see these incredibly huge statues. You can compare the size of the statue and you can compare it to, the, uh, to get the proportion, the size of the people watching it. And you can again climb here and some people will stay here for a couple of days in total isolation and enjoy quiet. The town itself, Jiayuguan, is a place where you can find yet another animal. Often when you do your crossword puzzle and they ask you about an animal that lives up in the Himalayas, this is what yak looks like. So these are the yaks and we have plenty of them in various forms and shapes and colors. They are adapted perfectly to live in this very, very cold climate when the mountains and the region is covered with snow for months every year. Bindling Sea takes us to this unique rock formation through which we can climb the mountain again to see more Buddha. Why am I concentrating so much on Buddha? Because we have Islam, we have Christianity, we have Buddhism, 
obviously, since we are, in, we are in China, I didn't dwell long on it, but we have Taoism and Confucianism and local indigenous, uh, all kinds of animistic religion, local animistic religion. Because I want to talk about the fact that the people who settled here, settled here because of the Silk Road. For example, in one of the oases, they specialize growing grapes. 150 miles away, they grow the most incredible melons you've ever had. This is the desert where they grow it. And that brings us into the town of Lanzhou. Now we are coming closer even to the big centers of silk production. And this is a place where you know Jews have walked through, Jews have traded. Jews were so curious when they got to these regions, they went further. Most people I told you didn't wander all the way into China. They went from one country to the other. They went from tra one trading post to another. The unusual part of this road with the religions, with the culture, with the art, is the Jewish story, which has entered and penetrated into this silk trading area. By the way, guys, we believe this is where noodles were created for the first time. The pasta, probably Marco Polo brought it to Italy after he's been to China for so many years, we don't know. But be we believe that this is where noodles were pulled by hand and introduced to the world. In the 10th century, the big capital, which also has seen, of course, the Jewish presence was Xi'an. Many of you would know Xi'an because of the story of the terracotta soldiers, remember? The emperor in the second century BCE wanted to be buried along with his army. He didn't bury his soldiers, but he created thousands of images of his soldiers who were buried with him in huge, huge cavities that were dug into the soil, into the dirt. And what's amazing about the soldiers, it's not made by a mold. Each one is produced and they are different. They look different from each other with different uniform, with different facial expression, with different headdresses. It's just mind boggling. And in this town, we'll see one of the most exciting mosques, which is built like a pagoda because we're in China. So even though it's a mosque and everything is written in Arabic and they pray their Muslim prayers, the place looks like a pagoda and it's quite fascinating to look into it. Those of you who have been to Xi'an would remember it also because, and if you didn't, please make it, move it somewhere up on your list, to go to the Shanxi History Museum where you see some of the oldest bronze issues. Look, this was made 2,500 years ago. Some of them were made over 3,000 years ago. How could they have crafted it? What technology did they have 3,000 years ago to have created this unbelievable stuff? They met, these are bells. They play concerts, knocking on the bells. You can play entire musical pieces, knocking on these bronze bells, guys, from 2,700 years ago. This is most unusual. Look at the beauty of the bronze. I mentioned Marco Polo, and a lot of what we know about China from centuries ago comes with him. And he also mentions the Jews. That's how the Jewish people in Europe found out that they're actually Jews living in China. And where do the Jews live? They live in this town of Kaifeng. I mentioned present tense. They still live here. There was a huge community that unfortunately was devastated by repeated flooding of the river in 1860s. Their synagogue was destroyed and there were no scholars and nobody could read the text. They were led by some of the people who remembered traditions and passed it from one to the other. Comes the 20th century between the Japanese occupation and then between the communist rule for many years and was almost completely forgotten anything. But in the recent years, they were discovered again. Tourists who come to see the marvels of this town have discovered the Jewish story. In the museums, we found these Jewish historical steles. Look at the years they were erected from the, 14, from the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, set among these gorgeous, gorgeous parks and gardens. These are the Jewish steles that are written in ancient Chinese form with some Hebrew in it, with lots of Jewish information in it. So that is the most exciting place. 
And let's go and visit some of the old timers who know that they were Jews because they have one of seven last names. The emperor has assigned seven last names for the Jews to name their families. So if you have one of these names, nobody else can use it, only the Jews for centuries. We're talking a thousand years. So if these people know that they are of Jewish extract, of Jewish descent, now there are big efforts to retrace. So we have emissaries going there. Uh, maybe uh, some of Adi's friends who went as a shaliach or shlicha, and they teach them Hebrew and they teach them Judaics. Uh, in Israel, in the Anu Museum, some of you might remember it as the Diaspora Museum, we have a scale model of their synagogue. Even the synagogue looked like a pagoda. Look at that. And many of you would know of these Jews if you read Pearl's back Peoni. Peoni takes place in the Jewish community of Kaifeng. I don't see your faces, but the few I see. Did anybody read the, this book by Pearl S. Back? Did anybody read this book? I don't so, see too many of your faces. I, maybe later on you can write in the chat because I, I'm curious if, uh, if uh, those of you who read the book realize and remember that it took place in the Jewish community of Kaifeng, a most amazing book. And if you didn't read it yet, make a point of getting it in the library or look it up somehow. Another, another uh, famous story took place which was performed on Broadway. This is Chu Chem, the first Chinese Jewish uh, musical. And it was written by Mitch Lee. Mitch Lee is the one who wrote The Men of La Mancha, one of the longest running musicals on Broadway. Unfortunately, the play about the Jews in Kaifeng didn't last very long, but it was featured on Broadway, which I think is quite remarkable. These are some of the younger members of the Jewish community of Kaifeng. Many of them have come to Israel, studied, went back. Some of them are staying in Israel. And look at these uh, cute Chinese kids eating the matzo because we, we make sure that we provide them with all the provisions needed to celebrate the holidays with text and books and what have you. And some of them are even practicing. Look at the guy, not only him with the yarmulka, but they create Chinese style yarmulka, obviously out of silk which they give to their members and you as tourists can also purchase them, which is quite amazing. Here you see one of their members who came to Jerusalem. Some of them were ordained. Some of them got smicha. They studied to be rabbis. A, because personally they wanted it. They've discovered something that was somewhere, somehow in their genes, in their cultural heritage, in the back of their minds. And many of them thought that they might one day go back and, and uh, provide this kind of spiritual guidance to the community, which is in Kaifeng. We move on and talk now. We are not uh, in, in Kaifeng anymore. We're moving to Shanghai, but also this place has seen Jews who came here. Some of them came with the traditional Silk Road, but now I'd like to talk about some modern Silk Road. The Jews who came here came mostly in the 19th century after centuries that China was close to foreigners, you might remember uh, the stories 55 day in Beijing and the Boxer riot and so on. And only in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, the Chinese government was giving in to the siege which was imposed on them by the superpowers, by the Americans, by the French, the British, the German, and they let people in. Among the first merchants who came here were Jews who came from India, but they were originally Iraqi Jews. They were Baghdadi Jews who came and set shop here. One of the most outstanding buildings that was built here was the Peace Hotel, right on the band. That's what they called the promenade along the Wapu River. The Peace Hotel was owned by the Sassoon family. You might have heard about the Sassoon family, but I praise them for setting up and helping the plight of 23,000 Jews who found themselves incarcerated during the years of World War II in a ghetto. They were Jews who escaped from Europe, were trying to get away through Russia, but big chunks of China by then were occupied by Japan. Japan occupied huge territory. People do not always realize. It was not that they decided just like that one day 
to hit Pearl Harbor and engage in a war against America. By then they were controlling parts of Korea, huge part of China, Southeast Asia, into Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, into parts of uh, um, Burma and into Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, huge empire. And the Jews who managed to come here, the Japanese didn't really know what to make out of them. They were rounded up into, were put into this ghetto. The ghetto still exists. I mean, the neighborhood is still there, Hongku. And this was uh, one of the houses that served later on as a synagogue. There is still a synagogue. Today it is mostly a museum because nobody really comes to pray here. Chabad prays in other locations in their own homes. But they set up a museum that tells the story of the ghetto. I must tell you something which is very important. When the Germans realized that the Japanese were incarcerating tens of thousands of Jews into a ghetto, believe it or not, they sent an officer who was already active by then. We are now in 43, in mass extermination of Jews in the extermination camps in Europe to teach the Japanese how to kill the Jews. The Japanese, who were known to be not the most delicate and most gentle people, looked at him as if he's absolutely crazy. He was dined and wined, and the same night he was put on the same plane, which took him back to Tehran on his way back to Germany. And all the Jews were protected there. Not a single Jew was hurt. Moreover, the Chinese remembered the help of some uh, Jews uh, that uh, provided help. For example, this, um, this Jacob Rosenfeld uh, was a doctor from Poland and Germany who sought refuge in China and he became the chief medical officer for Mao Zedong and helped him in his struggle. There was this consul, a consul uh, Ho Feng Shan. He was the consul in Vienna where the embassy was in Berlin. And against the clear instruction of his government, he issued visas, thousands of visas and let the Jews travel through the Trans-Siberian train to come into Manchuria, but unfortunately by then, uh, the Japanese incarcerated them into the ghetto. I believe many of you know the story of Chiyune Sugihara. Uh, to yesterday, we named a big square after him in Jerusalem, and it is something very special to us. You might know the story, and part of the people he saved, look, this is the entire Mir Yeshiva. All the dozens of students of the Mir Yeshiva were saved, and they set up in Shanghai. Can you imagine? They came from Lithuania and Belarus and the Kaduri and the Sassoons and the Khardun, the Levi families, the Baghdadi Jews took them into their own palaces. And these were the only Jews who were allowed to be outside of the ghetto. So they can continue their studies and the yeshiva moved later on to Israel where they still thrive and very, are very successful. But to think that they made it uh, during those years in Shanghai, this is a remarkable story. I want to talk about another uh, story, which is another road going through China with a Jewish twist to it. So this is the famous uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad, which the Jews have um, uh, taken in order to get to Japan. And from Japan, some of them ended in China, some of them after the war went to Australia, Canada, United States, many of them came to Israel. But something very strange happened here. Stalin wanted to show that he's not as bad as people were already saying and knowing that he is. Look at the size of this incredible country. This is Russia with 11 time zones tucked away in the far east of Russia. He created a Jewish state. Can you imagine? This is Birobijan. He created the country which speaks Yiddish, writes in Yiddish, not Hebrew, Yiddish. He's not a Zionist, but he says, oh, I respect all of my ethnic minorities. So can you imagine that for the last 80 years, there is the whole region that reads and speaks Yiddish. They publish the newspapers. Now, of course, Chabad comes, so you have kosher restaurants and what have you. They... Uh, created the signs so they should supposedly respect the Jewish culture. You see festival of Yiddish culture, of Jewish culture. They printed 
a Birobijaner Stern, the star of Birobijan, a newspaper, daily newspaper printed in Yiddish. Isn't that most amazing story to think that it happened? Of course, after the Soviet Union collapsed, nothing exists anymore. I mean, they still do all the stuff, but there is mixed population. Anybody who had their uh, ability, of course, and Israel welcomed everybody. They moved to Israel, they moved to Germany, to the United States, even Argentina. Some of them ended up welcomed by the Jewish community who's dwindling and they'll welcome anybody who comes from the former Soviet Union. Look at the synagogue. The place is so cold. We are on the edges of the world, really, tucked away so far east in the south of Siberia. And this is what the Siberian countryside looks like. These are the convoys. And guess what? The shepherds are still leading their herds with the sheep and goats on one hand. And next to them, you have the trains that go through and you have the cars and the super highways that connect it. China is plotting now the modern Silk Road. Only this Silk Road will be done by train, high speed train. They'll speed at over 200 miles per hour. And they're supposed to connect China through Central Asia into Turkey and from Turkey to go through another branch is gonna go through all of Europe into Western Europe, into Madrid. So this is the most incredible project, which they call it the modern Silk Road. There is also another modern Silk Road. Unfortunately, it's a result of an unfortunate phenomena, which is the global warming. But the global warming has melted big chunks of the Arctic Ocean. So now boats can go from China, travel around Siberia, go in the border between Siberia and Alaska. These are the Aleutian Islands and the Straits of Bering and go this way, either into uh, Western, into, sorry, into Eastern America or go into Europe, into Northern Europe and subsequently elsewhere. So this is gonna save them the long schlep that they had to go all the way around China, either through the Suez Canal or big boats cannot go through the Suez Canal. They have to go all the way around Africa in order to get to Europe. So this is the uh, China projects now that are being developed. And unfortunately, every year it's easier and easier because bigger and bigger parts of the Arctic Ocean are melting away. I'm sorry I rushed you through this presentation because I know that people have some limited time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. You'll be able to watch the recording and Karen and Adi and Rachel will send you the full presentation so you can take your time and look at the pictures and make notes of places you might want to uh, visit. And if anybody has any questions now, I welcome the questions. Again, I cannot begin to tell you, you don't know me, but I'm so embarrassed for this delay I hope you still were able to enjoy what we have done with this presentation. Any questions, please? Yes, Jacob, thank you so much. That was great. And please don't worry. I'm sure everybody understands, especially the people that live in Baltimore, California. We all deal with traffic, so don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, I had one. I have a question here. Um, I learned the Jewish merchants along the Silk R R Road had places uh, to rest for Shabbat. Is that true? Uh, second part of that question, how were Jewish merchants involved in the Silk Road? So the first question, we don't know of particular places where they would stop for Shabbat. We know that the caravan will move for a couple of days and then they'll stop for a couple of days. They'll move for a week or whatever and then they'll stop. So it could very well be that it was timed to accommodate the Jewish merchants. You have to realize Many of the merchants were Muslims who shared a lot with the Jews. They felt very close to them. They both don't eat pork. They circumcise. They pray where the other people don't pray. They pray from textbooks. The other people don't read and write from textbooks for their prayers. And so on and so on and so on. Uh, one of the ways for the Chinese to handle the Jews was very interesting which I didn't tell you because I was rushing, but now if I can take a minute, I'd like to tell you um, what was the contribution <laughs> and why were they so welcomed by the Chinese people? 
you know, how do you de define a Jew? The Chinese language, you know, doesn't create concepts. It doesn't create words or names. It's made out of the pictograms with notions. It's a concept. The pictogram describes an idea. So what will you describe the Jews? People who cover their head with the head cover, so do the Muslims. They don't eat pork, so do the Muslims. And so on, circumcised, so do the Muslims. But the Jews do something unusual. The Jews do not eat the tenderloin. The tenderloin is not kosher unless you go through a very complicated process of de-veining. So they cannot even um, sell it. They give it away. So isn't it wonderful to be the friend of the Jewish butcher? He gives you the best part of the meat and he doesn't charge you a penny for it. And that's how the Chinese call the Jews. The people who do not eat the tenderloin. The synagogue is the house of prayer of the people who do not eat the tenderloin. You know, for example, in Chinese, they don't call it America. America is the beautiful country. To describe happiness, they have a pictogram of a house and inside the house, a pictogram of a woman. A woman in a house is happiness and so on and so on. In the last few years, they came up with their pinyin, they came up with some kind of alphabetic phonetic script with 64 letters or whatever, or characters to be able to say high speed or whatever, things that you're not gonna paint with pictograms from thousands of years ago. To read a Chinese newspaper, you should be able to read at least 8,000 characters. To read a book, 16, 17,000. You to write a scientific article, 27,000. So there is no way. So I find it fascinating that that's what the Chinese thought about the Jews by uh, calling them or referring to them, among all other things, the people who do not eat the tenderloin. I don't know that they have contributed much to the development of the Silk Road. The Silk Road predates the existence even of the Jewish nation because we're talking 6,000 years. The Silk Road predates the arrival of Jews into Central Asia, which took place somewhere in the eighth or ninth century. But the fact that they settled in Kaifeng and built their own community there, I find it's fascinating. And I'm personally moved by the fact that they were almost completely gone and all of a sudden, there is this resurgence, there is rebirth, there is the revival of a Jewish presence in Kaifeng. For how long? I don't know. To what extent it will be? I have no idea. But I find it fascinating that it happens to begin with. Any Thank more you. questions, please? Um, how can, is there a way to purchase the Chinese kippahs that you were talking about? Uh, you know what? I never tried. I get it when I visit them. I never tried to purchase it online. But let me look into it. I'll write the guy named whatever Chin Chan, his name changed his name is now his Moshe. Isn't it nice to have? Oh. The Chinese Moshe. So I'll write to him and find out if. if he can sell them uh, and ship them online or somewhere. I'll find out and through Karen, you'll be able to. I'll... Okay. I think Jacob, you Hello. might have a Wi-Fi problem where you are. Can you I, hear now us? I hear you. Any question? Now I hear you better. Okay. I'm going to ask you one more question just because you might have... Um, let me try, one moment, let me try to connect to the lobbies, uh, to the hotel network. Oh, okay. Um, in the meantime, uh, just a reminder for next Tuesday that we have an event that won't be recorded. So please uh, make sure that you attend if you want to come. 
So I think I think we'll end this call just because it's past 12 and we usually go till 12. Uh, but we will see you next week on Tuesday. This event is live on YouTube and you can go to our YouTube channel, Baltimore Zionist District. Um, and